Good evening, everybody. Hello. Uh, we're just going to get started now uh, with the uh, KIAS launch event. Uh, thanks very much uh, for coming, everybody. Uh, my name's uh, Chris Hobbs. I'm a professor in science and international security in the Department of War Studies and director of the King's Institute for Applied Security Studies, uh, KIAS. So it's really my pleasure to welcome you here uh, today uh, and to King's. I want to thank Lauren and her team for all the work that they've done in organizing uh, this event. Uh, I also want to thank all of you uh, for coming. So what we see up on the slide is the rough agenda uh, for this evening. We're running a little bit behind, but I don't think that matters. Uh, we'll have plenty of time for networking and informal discussion a little bit later. So we're going to start with a couple of talks. And for this, we really just want to give some time outlining some of the different things uh, that we've been working on at KIAS and the broader School of Security Studies. We're then going to pass over uh, to uh, Professor uh, John Bew and Professor John Gearson. Uh, Professor John Bew um, is a foreign policy uh, advisor to the Prime Minister uh, and has very kindly come uh, to speak to us uh, today to talk a little bit about uh, the role that academics uh, can play uh, in government uh, when it comes to policy. Following the talks, and that will last to about 7.30 or so, uh, I'm going to invite all of you next door, where we have a number of research centers and research groups uh, in the School of Security Studies who are setting up uh, to talk about their different activities. Uh, a lot, and here's John. Thanks for joining us. Um, and a lot of these uh, also uh, sort of relate uh, to uh, working with practitioners, which is really the focus uh, of this evening. OK, so just very quickly in terms of the first set of uh, speakers. Uh, so in addition to myself, uh, I've also uh, we'll be hearing from Dr. Hugh Davis, who's head of online programs at the Institute, and Dr. Kay Tutting, who's head of uh, professional defense and security education. I should say that you know, Hugh, Kate, and myself have been working to establish the Institute uh, over the last 18 months, but we're really very ably supported by colleagues across the whole school, so from the Department of War Studies, uh, from the Department of Defense Studies, academics and researchers uh, that have helped get involved in, in our different activities uh, and products that we'll be talking about. We're also indebted to the professional services team uh, in the School of Security Studies, as well as central units uh, such as uh, KPED. And they've really helped take some of the ideas uh, which we have uh, off the ground and turn them into, uh, into some of the things that you'll see uh, today. OK, so just firstly, in terms of the big picture vision uh, for KIAS, uh, so here we're you know, very uh, much focused uh, on engaging uh, practitioners, uh, those that are working directly on defense and security issues, as well as those that may have a, an interest as part uh, of their job role. So this is something that's not uh, new to us uh, in the School of Security Studies. We've been doing this type of work uh, really for, for many uh, decades. But what we've really looked to try and do uh, in the Institute is to try and innovate uh, in a way that allows us to reach people uh, that ordinarily wouldn't necessarily have time alongside their busy J jobs uh, to engage with us uh, when it comes to uh, educational programs uh, and also up with our activities. We're also interested in developing uh, opportunities for direct engagement uh, when it comes to informing both policy uh, and practice. And I'll show some examples of how we've been looking to do that uh, in the coming slides. And then just finally, and this is more something uh, that is an internal uh, focus for us, some of the things we'll be talking about are, are relatively new uh, for the college uh, as a whole. Uh, and we're really interested uh, in sharing uh, and learning lessons from others uh, that are working uh, within this space. And it's really great to see colleagues uh, from across uh, the faculty and the broader college uh, here at this launch event. OK, so in terms of some principles, in terms of how we've approached uh, and it, to start with the new educational offerings uh, that we've been putting together. Uh, so here we've really looked uh, to consider the flexible accumulation uh, of credits that can be built up slowly over time and then cashed in for different types of postgraduate award, be those uh, postgraduate certificates, postgraduate diploma, uh, or even up to a full uh, MA. So here we've really looked to build on the new uh, King's College uh, stackable framework for stackable awards, uh, which was launched uh, just a couple of years ago. Uh, and we've looked to build programs uh, on top of that incorporating a number of things uh, which allow uh, practitioners uh, and others uh, to take advantage uh, of education uh, they may already have conducted uh, through the recognition of prior credits. So for example, academic courses taken here at King's uh, or other universities uh, that can be used uh, as part of a future uh, award. 
also recognition uh, of prior formal learning. Uh, so for example, professional development courses uh, that might have been taken uh, but never formally accredited, as well as recognition of prior Eric's, Eric's, sorry, uh, experiential uh, learning um, or RPE. Uh, so these uh, really sort of relates to people that have spent say 20 years uh, in a government role uh, where they've done a lot of the things uh, that you would actually sort of equate to learning outcomes uh, on some of our modules. So here we've looked to sort of uh, draw that experience across uh, so that can be considered uh, for credits uh, again to, uh, uh, to an award. More broadly as part of this, uh, we've really looked to be interdisciplinary uh, where we can, uh, recognizing that today's complex security and defense challenges require a range of different perspectives and approaches. We're very interdisciplinary in the school uh, already. We've sought to increase this through parking internally uh, with different units uh, within the university, as well as external partners. And we'll see some examples of projects to that end uh, in a moment. We're also interested in bridging the gap between theory uh, and practice. And here, for across a number of our programs, we have this quite unique approach of co-developing and co-delivering uh, with practitioners, uh, be those in government, the military, uh, or industry. So here I just wanted to show you uh, all where GIAS sits uh, within the broader college and within the broader school uh, of security uh, studies. Uh, so again, we were set up just a, a couple of years ago uh, now, uh, and we sit alongside the very well-established uh, Department of War Studies uh, and Department of uh, Defense Studies. And as mentioned, we've really drawn on uh, the expertise and support of colleagues uh, in terms of launching a number of our initiatives. The school itself, it's, it's very large uh, and diverse. It really does cover all aspects uh, of defense and security approximately 200 staff, a mix of academics, researchers, and professional services uh, team. We also have a vast array uh, of postgraduate and undergraduate programs, which includes more than 100 optional 15 credit modules. And in fact, this is actually really important, uh, in particular for the stackable, uh, for the flexible MA in security studies uh, that we'll talk about, uh, as these can help form the building blocks uh, of that program. And as mentioned, uh, you know, there has been this long history of engagement between academics uh, and others in the school uh, with government, the armed forces uh, and industry, and we're just looking to sort of build uh, and extend that. So here is a precursor to later this evening when we go across to the south side of Bush House. Uh, I just wanted to highlight uh, that we do have a, a number of sort of active uh, research groups and centers uh, within uh, the school, within the two departments, uh, which undertake a really a wide range uh, of work across uh, defense and security. And here, this is just a really small uh, snapshot uh, of what some of these research centers uh, and groups uh, do. Uh, topics ranging from strategic communications uh, to nuclear non-proliferation, to space security, to counterterrorism, uh, to military ethics, uh, and many, many more uh, as well. So these groups really help drive uh, practitioner uh, engagement, as well as research and other activities. Uh, many of these groups provided useful vehicles uh, for our development of impact case studies that were submitted to the REF uh, in 2021. 20, uh, I also just wanted uh, to show the scale of activity uh, within the school uh, when it comes to third stream. So executive education, continuing professional development, as well as advisory uh, and consulting work. So a significant fraction of that uh, constitutes uh, the work that we do at the Defense Academy uh, that Kate will talk about uh, in just a moment. Uh, but we also have a number of other significant uh, projects, uh, more than 25 active ones at the moment with a similar number uh, in the pipeline uh, that sort of provide support uh, and engagement uh, with a wide variety of stakeholders, both in the UK and uh, internationally. And here I just wanted to give a very quick example uh, of one of these projects, because it's quite a unique project uh, in some ways. Uh, so this is the UK's uh, Nuclear Security Culture Program, uh, funded and managed by the Department of Business, Energy uh, and Industrial Strategy, and then implemented in an academia industry consortium, led by King's, uh, but we've partnered with two uh, industry bodies, uh, NTS uh, and Amport Risk. So under this program, we worked for eight years <coughs> around the world uh, with partners in different countries uh, to strengthen the security of nuclear materials, and by doing so, one of the ways uh, to reduce the possibility uh, of nuclear terrorism. So we ran over 80 uh, activities uh, in 12 countries uh, from 2014 to 2022, uh, and it was a very diverse array uh, of what we did. So it was a mix of uh, CPD, uh, train the trainer. We did a lot of applied research around contemporary uh, issues. Uh, and then we actually went down to the more operational levels uh, of security, supporting um, 
organizations with critical nuclear materials in a range of different countries uh, when it came to assessing uh, their security, in particular sort of focusing on uh, the human factor uh, and other elements uh, to that. We also provided on the end, other end of the spectrum high-level policy advice, engaging with organizations such as the International Atomic Energy uh, Agency uh, and many others. And if you want to learn more about that project, we have uh, information uh, at the Center for Science and Security Studies uh, booth uh, next door. I also just wanted to flag something uh, which is upcoming, which I think may be of relevance or of interest uh, for maybe many people uh, in the room. And this is a Wargaming Week uh, that will be running at King's at the end of May uh, to the start of June. Uh, so it's something uh, that's been put together by the King's Wargaming Network. Again, you have a booth and even a, a small war game uh, which you can play, which is set up uh, next door. Uh, and this is an event that they've been developing in partnership uh, with NATO. It's going to be a mix of looking at some of the different uh, methodological approaches uh, to designing war games. And there's going to be a large game that's going to be won uh, as part of the week, uh, focusing on conflict uh, in Eastern Europe uh, and having a look uh, at different uh, levels uh, of escalation. Okay, so now I want to move on uh, to a new educational product uh, that we've been developing uh, within the Institute. Uh, so this is the smallest unit of learning that we have uh, within the school. It can be completed in just five hours. Um, and when you sign up for it, uh, it's immediately uh, available. So it's five hours of asynchronous uh, learning. Uh, standalone, if you took one of these online short courses, uh, it would be unaccredited. Uh, but as Hugh will talk a little bit more about later, uh, there's the possibility of combining sets uh, of three of these online uh, short courses, adding live sessions and assessment uh, to then accumulate uh, sets of 15 credits. Uh, and this can be done a number of times uh, within, this, within the flexible uh, MA in security studies we'll talk about in a second. And here are some of the different online short courses uh, that we've been developing. We think these are of great relevance uh, for practitioners uh, working on security. Those on the left uh, are ones which are currently available, and you can sign up um, and, and get involved uh, with those later, uh, should you like. I should flag here, we're actually doing a, a small early bird discount uh, on these courses, so they're 20% off. Uh, sound like a salesperson now, um, which is not quite the intention, uh, until the end of this month. Uh, so again, if you're particularly interested in these, then now is the time uh, to sign up and, uh, and get engaged. And on the right-hand side, these are other courses that are under development. Uh, we should have these launched in the next uh, two or three months uh, or so. As you can say, it's a very diverse range, really drawing on the sort of breadth of expertise uh, that we have within the school. And here I just want to uh, embarrass uh, Professor Ken Payne if he's in the room. I'm not sure if he is. Uh, but this is the module that he's put together, which looks at artificial intelligence and national security. And here you can see that it's a mix of texts, uh, videos, uh, we have infographics, we have knowledge checks uh, as you pass uh, through the model, module. Okay, and with that uh, short introduction, I'll pass over to my colleague Hugh. He's going to take us through our online MA programs. Good evening, everyone. Uh, as Chris said, I'm Dr. Hugh Davis. I'm the head of online programs for the King's Institute of Security Studies. And I want to talk to you for a few minutes tonight about the online programs that we've run in security studies, but also some of the new uh, ventures that we're trying to put together with, uh, with, the, um, with the Institute. Uh, and that includes the flexible MA in security studies. Uh, so the genesis of the online programs uh, actually predates the, uh, the um, institution of, uh, of KIAS by a number of years. The first of the, of the programs was International Affairs, which came online in 2018. Uh, the objective of this program was to bring the world-leading in-person education that we delivered, uh, both in London and at the Defence Academy, to a much wider global audience. Uh, and uh, we launched International Affairs in, in 2018. The entire point of this programme is a generalist curriculum. It combines the unique combination of subject matter within the School of Security Studies of uh, International Relations, Security Studies expertise, uh, Strategic Studies expertise and Conflict History expertise to uh, bring together to a, for a, a generalist curriculum, one that appeals to a very large audience. And I'll talk a little bit, a bit about the audience that these programs cater to. Uh, there are several uh, specialist pathways within the program though um, and uh, students can specialise in these pathways uh, uh, by taking two 
specific modules on, on, on the subject matter. The first of those is espionage and surveillance, intelligence studies, where we, uh, we look in depth at the, uh, uh, the influence of intelligence on international security and, uh, and indeed in war. Uh, the second of those is cybersecurity, and the third is uh, uh, more recently added strategic studies uh, pathway. All of those allow students to specialise, and uh, the specialisms are defined by two specific modules on the subject plus a, uh, a, a dissertation. Global, se global security was put together a number of years later, just as KIAS was coming online. And the uh, objective with global security was to cater to a market that international affairs was very slightly missing out on. The market that for, uh, wanted more specialist education uh, uh, on, on security studies itself, uh, particularly in a, glo in a global uh, framework. Um, and it's the, the objectives of this programme were to, uh, was to look very much at aspects which lie outside of the, uh, of, of the more traditional security study, studies model. So there's lots of uh, discussions of climate and health security, human rights, ethics, law, uh, conflict and security and justice, and also science and non-traditional security threats. Um, so it caters to a, very, a, a, a rather more niche market, but one that nevertheless uh, we felt when we were uh, analysing the market for international affairs had, had been missed. So uh, we created global security uh, to, to uh, 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 appeal to that. And it's been very successful since its launch in January 2022. Defining features of both programmes are that it's a flexible cu uh, curriculum. Students can take modules uh, six times a year and they can uh, opt out of modules to, uh, uh, to allow them to cater for busy periods in their, in their, uh, uh, in their careers or in their personal lives. Um, it, it also allows students to really adapt to a, uh, and create a bespoke uh, educational pathway uh, through the programmes. And it's also worth bearing in mind that uh, the two programmes can share modules as well. It is, though, defined by very challenging and engaging content. Uh, we have a series, all modules defined by a, a, a series of uh, recorded lectures, but also uh, uh, activity-based learning, uh, knowledge checks, and uh, uh, live webinars and discussion forums. So it's a, a, a wide range of, of educational interventions. Um, and we also employ a really quite diverse and wide range of assessment that's both innovative and rigorous. So we maintain the level seven standards that you expect of an MA from King's College London. Uh, so that's the broad overview of the, of the online programmes that exist. The market that we currently uh, uh, cater to is, is really quite global in scale. This, every country that we have students from is represented on this, on this map. Uh, and that's 550 students in total for international affairs and just over 100 for, glo uh, for global security. Um, uh, so these are very successful programs uh, uh, and, and global, uh, global security is growing. As you can see, the principal markets for uh, uh, international affairs and global security are the United States, United Kingdom, uh, uh, Canada, Australia, but also um, uh, some Middle Eastern countries as well and European countries. So it, it, it is a, a broad uh, 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 market for, for, the, for the programs. The type of students that we have on these courses and to which the, uh, the, the courses appeal, generally mid-career professionals who are either looking to get a leg up in their, in their uh, current um, uh, career or to move and transition to a new career. So we've had a number of students who have transition from a career in uh, um, non-governmental organisations to the security sector. Uh, we had a wonderful uh, testimonial from a student who uh, moved from a, basically a volunteering position in, uh, in the Red Cross uh, and combining it with some of her earlier professional experience as now a security analyst for BA. So it actually has a genuine impact on, on, on people's uh, lives. Um, we cater, I think, as well to a very strong security and defence market, as you would expect. We have a lot of security and defence professionals, both from the armed forces, but also from governmental agencies. And uh, uh, non-governmental organisations are very well represented in our student body as well. Um, and a fair few diplomats uh, uh, as well um, that have 
uh, take some time out of their busy schedules to participate in our webinars and bring a real diversity of opinion and thought to, their, uh, to those sessions. In fact, I love teaching this, this program because you go on, the, on a team screen in front of you, as well as it might be unfortunate that you're stuck on teams, you've still got people joining from Wellington and Vancouver and pretty much every, everywhere in between. In between. It's, it's a really uh, uh, wonderful experience to teach on. And I hope that the students and, uh, and the testimony has seemed to reflect this uh, feel that way as well. So that's the overview of the market and the, and the content of international affairs and global security. We're also launching a flexible uh, master's in security studies. Uh, so if you bear with me, this is a quite a complex program, but I've tried to break it down into, uh, into some uh, easy, to, uh, easy to understand bite-sized snippets. So the foundation of this, of this program is the short courses that Chris uh, has, already, has already mentioned. Uh, and that's all of them there represented as they, cur as they currently are. We'll be, we'll be having more than the 13 that are currently on the board, but that's the 13 that we've got in, in progress at the moment. As, as uh, Chris said, uh, students can take any combination of three of those, uh, uh, those uh, uh, programs, uh, those courses rather, and once they've done those, those three, they can uh, enrol, uh, apply to enrol on our uh, flexible MA in security study. And when they do so, they can apply for recognition of prior credit, learning or experience. And in this, in this case, they'll be applying for recognition of prior learning. Because the short courses are not assessed, so we need to understand how we're going to assess them. So we take any combination of those three short courses and we provide a 15 credit module assessment, which is a sh about a 3,000 word essay, which then assesses the learning objectives of those three courses put together. And it can be any combination of those three courses. They've been specifically designed to be interchangeable in, in this context. But it doesn't stop there. You can take a combination of six and uh, get a 30 credit uh, uh, module, a combination of nine, get 45 credits, and a combination of 12, and you get 60 credits. So in, I mean, I appreciate perhaps 15, 30, 45, 60 doesn't really mean very much to you. Uh, uh, that uh, 60 credits is one third of, uh, of an MA. Uh, so you can do one third of the MA using the short courses and then to top that up with assessments and live sessions and get those, uh, those uh, uh, credits. You can then progress to the remainder of the MA by selecting a, a series of existing modules from either war studies or defence studies uh, and select them at one's discretion. So you can take uh, uh, modules when you're able to um, and, uh, uh, and ones that interest you. And there's a, these are just a selection of the ones that are available. We're looking at a very broad range of, of, of uh, modules from across both departments. So hopefully that's made some sense and the short courses are going live as we speak. I'd also like to talk very briefly about another initiative within the, uh, uh, the Institute and that's the uh, uh, Security and Defence uh, Plus uh, partnership, which is part of the PLUS Alliance, the alliance uh, between King's College London, the University of New South Wales and Arizona State University. We've been working very hard with our partners uh, in those two universities to develop a series of educational interventions, uh, research collaborations and uh, hopefully some joint degree opportunities as well and programmes are currently under, devel uh, under development and we're also looking at uh, um, some uh, uh, similar uh, executive and professional um, uh, short courses along with the lines of the ones that we've been looking at in KIAS that could be uh, delivered jointly by the three universities. Quite a unique uh, uh, opportunity there. But there is already one underway uh, at, at the moment. In uh, 15th to the 18th of May, we have a short course, an executive uh, education course uh, uh, called AUKUS in Context. Um, it'll be no surprise really that, the, that Security and Defence Plus is, is uh, being built around the new AUKUS agreement uh, between the United States, the United Kingdom and Australia. And our objective with this course is to place the new AUKUS agreement in context and bring uh, some 
uh, context to the announcement which very helpfully has just been trailed will be made on uh, uh, Monday uh, in San Diego by President Biden, uh, uh, Prime Minister Sunak and uh, Prime Minister Albanese. So we've got there a, uh, an opportunity here to really develop some of those ideas. So those, um, that course will be expert led. We're going to be looking at the impacting of, uh, impact of game-changing technology that the, uh, that the uh, a new partnership uh, seeks to uh, bring to bear. We're also going to bring some regional security experts to uh, provide some much-needed context to the, uh, to the uh, uh, agreement. We're also going to talk about the much grander strategic uh, uh, implications of the alliance, uh, sorry, the partnership, and the, uh, we'll conclude the course with a, uh, an Indo-Pacific theatre war game. Um, which our colleague Davy Banks is putting, is putting together. Um, it will be both uh, 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 delivered with a, a set of pre-recorded uh, lectures and also live. And we're going to try and do it so that we have people from uh, the US, Australia and the UK uh, uh, communicating and talking together about these subjects um, uh, at the same time, which will make the timing of it a little... Uh, a little fruity, but um, I'm sure you'll agree with it. It'll be worth it. If you're interested, get your cameras out <laughs> and scan the QR code to go direct to the uh, the King's East store to sign up immediately. Thank you very much. I'm going to hand over to my colleague Kate Utting, who's going to talk about uh, the defence and security education. Thank you. Um, I get so, I'm the head of professional defence and security education in Kaya. So, I've also been a long term member of the Defence Studies Department for the last 25 years. It's my pleasure to talk about the renewal of our partnership with the British military and allies and partners across all of the courses that we teach under the new CSAP arrangements. We're very delighted to see some of our colleagues from the Defence Academy here this evening. Um, and I would like to talk to you about the different types of courses that we, have, we teach currently. I'd like to um, talk about our long-term experience of teaching the military. Remember, King's was founded by the Duke of Wellington, but I'll start in 1961. Don't worry, I'm not going to go way back to the 19th century. If we remember that the Department of War Studies was founded by Professor Sir Michael Howard in 1961 on the day that he decided to stick a piece of paper on his door to say Department of War Studies. And since then, very much in line with our current mission, service to society, we have had a long tradition at things in Department of War Studies, Defence Studies, and in the wider school of teaching those who serve and helping them in their career development. We teach over 55 nations, members of security services and military um, amongst them. So, the new contract, building on this very, very long-term relationship we've had with the Ministry of Defence, we teach in three units currently, the Joint Services Command and Staff College, which teaches officers, civil servants, and partners across 55 nations from um, two years out of initial officer training on the intermediate command and staff courses to the mid-career course of 260 students per annum on the advanced command and staff courses, where we offer three MA pathways one in Defence Studies that has been going since 1997, an MSc in um, Defence Innovation, and an MRes in Defence Studies II. The Land Command Staff College is a unit within the Defence Academy, which has gone quite independent recently, but we are still continuing our support for the British Army, and we also offer a Master's for that course as well. The Royal College of Defence Studies started a master's with us 
back in 2001, and we, we have been supporting that top 1% of the British Armed Forces that go to the Royal College of Defence Studies, again, very much a focus on international collaboration. So that is the, the, the breadth. We can happily say since 1997, 5,000 5, members of the military have postgraduate degrees from King's College London, which is a wonderful achievement, including the Chief of the De Defence Staff, Admiral Sir Tony Radican, who was my dissertation student um, back in 2000, I hasten to add. He obviously did very well, <laughs> and he did get a distinction. Um, but CSAP and what we do at the Defence Academy is just part of the story, um, because our model of working in collaboration and in partnership in the creation and the delivery of postgraduate graduate education to defence and, and security professionals is something that we are constantly seeking to improve by listening to the requirement of our professional partners to understand the value of being relevant, up to date with the here, today concern, but also preparing these officers and civil servants to fight tomorrow. So we're very much involved in a dialogue of listening to new requirements, developing postgraduate educational products together and delivering them together. I sit at the front of a class with a colleague and I've got one of my colleagues from RCDS here, Gavin, who we sit at the front of the class and we teach together. That's quite an interesting proposition. It's not just about teaching professionals, it's teaching with a with a professional to deliver this education. And I have to say, it is a wonderful experience, very challenging. For the new contract, we decided that we would try and give our military colleagues some depth of resource so that they could draw on all of King's expertise, whether it's in the School of Security Studies, the King's Business School, um, the Policy Institute, the Russia Institute, etc., so that they could partner with King's as a whole and draw on expertise across the university to inform the development of curricula. The other new aspect of our new partnership um, with the Ministry of Defence is bringing also Cranfield University, who's, who also supports courses at um, the Defence Academy as a direct subcontractor to this new contract, plus working with RAND Europe. So this is a very exciting enterprise for us in designing new courses for the military. But also, we have a member of staff, Jared, I hope he's here this evening, who is our senior academic advisor to a project that RAND won with the Doctrine Centre, also based at Shrivenham, to develop um, doctrine with the military. So RAND's working with us to deliver CSAP, and we're working with RAND to deliver at the Doctrine Centre. It goes beyond the UK. We've had quite a, an, a long history with supporting professional military and security education in Qatar, and we have very recently started a brand new, almost unique program, we could say, in this country, where we are teaching for the first time in Arabic. This is a great new development for our school and for the university, we think, because it has the ability to be a model that we can replicate in other situations, we hope. That's me done. Over to the boys, shall we come up onto the stage? Perfect. We're running a little bit behind. If there are any burning questions, we could potentially take them, or if not, we might pass over to, uh, to John and John for the next uh, session. Nothing too burning, so I think John and John, uh, we'll pass over to you. We've got a couple of mics if you'd like to come up. There's stairs on that side, or you can... Very good. That's on. Okay. Okay, yeah, good, good evening everybody. Um, I'm John Gearson, I'm head of the School of Security Studies and I was just think, sitting here listening to this presentation thinking 
the last 20 years of my career would have been so much easier if all of these things had been agreed about 18 years ago, uh, rather than uh, uh, 18 months ago. But, uh, but it's, it's a fantastic, exciting time for the school. Um, and um, you know, we're very grateful for everyone to have joined us this evening and, and for the, the opportunity of growing Kayas you know, with our partners and with our friends, which is what it's all about, ultimately, in, in support of education. Now, one of our friends, and at, at times one of our, one of our colleagues, um, is Professor John Bew. Uh, for those of you who don't know, should know, uh, he's currently uh, the, well, we'll call it foreign policy advisor to the prime minister, but I think, I think it's probably foreign security and defense policy advisor at various times. And I'll let John talk a little bit more about um, exactly what he does. But the idea is that we're going to have a little conversation because long before John, well, I was going to say started, but anyway, long before John joined King's, um, I left... Uh, kings for, for secondments to Parliament as a uh, defence policy advisor and at the time was the first academic to be in that sort of role. And so the idea is that we'll, we'll have a conversation maybe and see what's changed in the last 15 to 20 years a little bit uh, and, and perhaps what's, what's continuing to, to go uh, pretty much unchanged perhaps. Um, obviously John is in a more political environment. I mean, I was going to say as an opening observation, John, you've got it easy. All you have to do is please one boss with, from one political party. I used to have to write things that four political parties all could agree to uh, and, and sign up to. So apart from the fact you've got an easier job than, than I had, I just wanted I'd, to... I had uh, three bosses in 12 weeks, John. Yeah, well, I was going to say... <laughs> yeah. Well, we're going to come on to that in a minute, uh, actually. I've got a, uh, got a nice question for you about that. Um, John also is, uh, is getting on a bit, so he won't remember that I was on the appointment panel that uh, brought John into King's. So it didn't surprise me uh, to learn that he'd been poached by, uh, by the Prime Minister's office uh, to go and work with them. Um, so the first question is, uh, you know, how are you feeling uh, you know, at, at the moment? You've, you've, you've gone through uh, a number of Prime Ministers. Uh, you're still standing. Uh, you know, how, how's it going? Um, well, actually, so, the, so t two headline observations. Um, f the first is just looking at the screen, just how pertinent and bang on I think so much of that is and how much relates to what I've been thinking about and working on for the last um, couple of months. Because we just, as I left number 10 this evening, we the, the left all the hard civil servants still working. Um, uh, but they're submitting the refresh of the integrated review this evening to the printers. I know that we'll call them up tomorrow and say, can you change X, Y, Z? Um, but but that, that, and I just thought, you know, in terms of the, the scope and, and the, the, on the various courses, just, just how relevant that is from the AI course, defense and deterrence, lessons from Ukraine, one year on, it absolutely is exactly what people in government are thinking. Um, I'm just not sure they even get enough time to, to, to do it, and I, that's crucial. Second, just, just very personal observation, is that in, in the third row I can see my head of department sitting beside a, a colleague of mine from the cabinet office who worked very intensely on the last integrated review, who just happened chance to be sitting beside each other, um, which, is, which is sort of tells you about the, 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 uh, the link between the two things. And, and uh, Gavin, who's sitting beside Matt, will recognize just why I look so frazzled and exhausted because we're, he, he was very much involved in the, in the last integrated review as well. Um, so, so I'm feeling, I'm feeling pretty good. It's nice to be among friends and, and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and colleagues. And, and um, you know, it's, it's an incredible experience coming back up to King's, which I obviously don't do every day like I did beforehand and seeing this whole sort of pedestrian, pedestrianized zone out the front and coming to kind of what looks on the surface as a completely different environment than the mad circus I work in most days and then coming in and just saying that it is there's a kind of intellectual loop and connectivity between the two that's really quite strong and close so um, I won't I won't probe about you know why you went uh, most people here would probably regard it as, as self-evident uh, that the opportunity came along um, but as an academic and as, 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 as obviously a distinguished academic with your publications how did you find fitting into a, an environment that's actually dominated by career civil servants, special political advisors uh, who are around, and then elected politicians? Um, you know, how far were you the, the very much the odd person out? Funny enough, John, so you mentioned, uh, maybe it's all your fault, because um, the, the, probably the way I got into this is doing exactly what you did, which is being a specialist on the Foreign Affairs Committee or the Defence Committee and helped with their, their sort of Global Britain report and had to do the sim similar things. Um, 
Um, so that's probably the kind of entrance into the world, and then, and it is. Um, uh, I'm a sort of. I was certainly, to a certain extent, an odd fit, having been a recent biographer of Clement Attlee, um, uh, writing for the New Statesman at the time, and then going into to conservative government. But actually, the, the, the sort of the, the best answer to that question is: I've just come off a call earlier today from a group of senior Americans previewing our integrated review, and it's so common in other systems to have um, um, academic specialist expertise go into government and work in certain things. Very common in this sort of science and technology area as well. I think for people like Anthony Finkelstein or um, uh, people like Patrick Valance, who are much more distinguished than I am, but it, but it, but it, does, it does happen, it can happen. And historically, I mean, I'm a historian and I was writing about this before I came in, at sort of periods of flux and crises and change in, in British constitutional history as well. You've had quite a serious tradition of academics going in and out or, or that, that connectivity between academia and, and, and government happening. So I think there's a precedent for it. Um, it's not that common. Um, um, and, you know, you can't, I guess my one sort of framing observation is it, it, to make it work and to go in, you can't rely on the purity of your expertise or wisdom. You've got to be political and you've got to act, act and, and respond to that environment. Um, but um, I, don't, I don't think it's too uncommon. Um, probably will be complete scorched earth after, after I leave and go back to Kings and no one will ever do it again. Um, but I think it's, it, it, it does happen and it, 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 it's, you know, um, probably deeply frustrating in some respects, both for me and for, 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 for the people I have, poor people I have to work with. But, it, but for the most part, it's, it's, you know, it's deeply enriching and, and, and a useful exchange. And I guess the, the key, key kind of thing is that you, you, you know, when you're in government, you're, you, to a certain extent, depend on the kind of petrol fumes of the things you've learned or written or thought about before, and you don't have as n enough time to replenish and keep thinking and analysing. And, and, and I think that's necessary if you're working in the business of national security and defence and policy. So people do need that that year off here or there. That that if I could, if I could change one thing, and for people who work in the national security secretariat, secretariat, be to give them a reading week actually, um, because it, it's so hard to do that. You're servicing ministers, papers, um, fighting over minutes and things like that. So I think, I think that, that, that's a sort of vital thing that Kings can potentially provide. Okay, you're, you're touching a number of things that I wanted to raise. Um, how about um, academics working in the policy environment? And, and what do you think they perhaps bring that isn't automatically there? I mean, is it, is it, 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 are, are these transferable skills, or is there something about um, you know, the academic training that you had and, and your experience that allowed you to bring something um, particular to the role? So there's lots of things you don't bring, which, is, which are quite important to probably start with. So, you, you know, you don't, by and large, have field experience, some of the harder edge experiences, you know, the, 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 the person who I'm currently working with most closely who's acting as the kind of scribe for the, for the whole integrated review refresh, has you know, field experience of, of um, the, our, our mission in Paris, um, um, uh, Iraq as well, during some really difficult years, years as well. So you must have the humility to recognize you don't have that experience. I guess you do bring a, um, you know, a certain, this is the petrol fumes thing, you bring um, um, a reserve of thought and study that other people have not had the opportunity to be afforded to. So you have you have something there. You have a sense of debates and, and, and things, and you do and you do bring a different type of network. So if if you're dealing with the American system particularly, but I think it applies increasingly to a lot of different parts of um, 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 you know our European relationships as well. You, I mean, I'm often bumping into people who have King's connections or academic connections as well who are nested in. Prime Minister's offices in Estonia, Finland, um, um, uh, Paris as well. So, so th th you do bring a different type of a network, actually. Um, and I think that, 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 that can have its uses um, um, in, in some, some scenarios. In fact, the last conference they organized just downstairs here um, had a number of senior people who were not, this was during the, the, the um, latter stage of the Trump administration, who were, of course, not in the Trump administration, but who subsequently went on move from academia, think tanks, into senior places in the, in the Biden administration, and, and one of whom I will see in Monday in San Diego when I, when I, when I go, go for the PM for the AUKUS announcement. So it's a different type of network. I think that, that is a valuable thing. So I assume you had a long and detailed induction when you first went into uh, Downing Street. 
That's right. That, that, but my, um, you, you have a photo taken of your first day, and you're onboarding, and, there's, I, 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 it, and it's still my photo, and when you get an email from me, which is de utter despair, stress, and panic. It was the hottest day of the year in July 2019. And I, uh, I, I turned up the day, and I, I basically, my thought for the first, first 24 hours was, what the hell have I done? This is a complete disaster. I don't know why I've done this. And I, my, this, this, this expression is eternalized. Uh, in any email you get from me, and I'm, prob I'm probably sort of 40 to 60 percent of the time, I still think that anyway. Um, so um, yeah, I know it's a, a completely different experience in terms of the pace um, um, uh, and just sort of frenetic nature of it, and just just moving into a comp you know just a just a, a sort of different different world in terms of who you answer to, how you answer, uh, uh, how you answer as well. So I'm, I'm still not quite sure I've cracked it, um, but it, it, it's com yeah. Um, this is a different mental universe, but but I mean, still for all the dramas externally, it's it's you know the same as academia. You, you're basically working with highly motivated, talented, intelligent people doing, making difficult choices, and and so it is is enriching from that perspective. Yeah, I, I was going to try just an in, in a sort of internal, inward-looking academic question to some extent. Yes, all of us, as has been set out, have been involved in our school in, in, in many cases of doing uh, commissioned research, trying to support policy, writing things. But nevertheless, academics generally write their own articles, their own books, they do their own research, they bring their own perspectives. How difficult has it been for you to sometimes have to toe the line on something that is, that is political, where perhaps you know, your analytical to, uh, your analytical instincts might have taken you in, an, in another direction. Um, you've said already you can't just sort of say, you know, I'm the great academic, you know, to carry a, to carry a room. H how do you adapt to that? Uh, I mean, the, the advantage you don't, I don't, I don't, and the people writing the stuff behind the scenes don't wear the responsibility. So it's the minister who's who has to stand up on their hind legs in in whatever scenario and speak to and wear that wear the responsibility for those decisions. And then it's even more challenging when you've got things like national security strategies, which are based on collective agreement and inputs from different departments across what also. So, so I mean, that, that's, you know, you obviously you can steer and shape and, and, and from the perspective of number 10, you have quite a privileged position because you, you're, you're close to the person who has ultimate authority over it. Um, but, um, uh, but it's easy enough because you don't wear the responsibility for it. I mean, it's often, you know, like each, each sort of big set piece speech is never as you wanted or intended. And then there are, you know, there are, there's, there's five, six, seven personalities and you think, well, like, so, so, so it's, uh, I mean, each bit of that is iterative, it, but, but ultimately you don't wear the responsibility. So you are behind the scenes. You don't, you know, it's not, it's not, it's not on you. So in one sense, it's, it's kind of liberating, but you know, plenty of times that your, your principal says things and you wince and weep and hide um, but that's 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 the kind of that's the nature of the beast so John you'll be surprised to know that I'm not going to ask you to tell us the contents of your your whatsapp uh, list on, on your phone um, doubtless you are preserving it to memory rather than onto a flash drive uh, as you move forward but whilst being careful not to give away too much um, I'm interested to know whether you think that advisors can make a difference and could you anonymize as best you can, perhaps give an example of where external advisors working inside the, 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 the center can make a difference? Mm, good question. I mean, I, th I think they can make a difference, otherwise people wouldn't have them around. Um, um, and it depends on the person you're trying to make the difference on. Um, um, I'm trying to think of a good example that doesn't sound aggrandizing or reveal something I shouldn't reveal. Um, uh, I mean, the advantage of being in for quite a, quite a few years now is you do different, different skill sets. On one hand, you do, you know, end up to de facto doing negotiations for which personal relationships and things like that um, um, matter. Uh, probably the best thing you can do is to stop stupid things happening by running from room to room and saying this is a mistake or this is a trap. Um, and you, you, you know, it, you can, I guess, more effectively anticipate when things look stupid um, uh, and are, are going to backfire um, because you're spending more time thinking on that special subject and you know the, the real challenging thing about what the, the prime ministers have to do or ministers in general is they've got 15 different things going on simultaneously and so they they rely on you to be a kind of early warning system 
across the piece. That's probably the most useful thing you can do in sort of um, um, uh, 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 political terms as well. Um, but the other things you do are just just sort of matters of you know professional human conduct, which is you know I guess you know, I may may have had a difficult boss or two, um, uh, and if you, you can help sort of smooth the edges or follow up and sort of put the furniture back together or. or <laughs> Or um, you know, the, 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 I guess you can you can have that effect sometimes as well um, on the side, but that's that's less my job than than, than stopping uh, stupid things happening, which has been plenty of stupid things have happened. So um, I've also done it not done it very well. I remember talking to uh, McGeorge Bundy, who was uh, John F. Kennedy's national security advisor uh, at, an, at an oral history uh, event that, that we that we held, where he told. Uh, a pretty aggressive academic who was saying, why didn't you do this and why didn't you do that? You know, why didn't JFK decide to do this? And he said, when you're in, in this case, the White House, you look for opportunities not to take decisions. I remember being very confused when I heard that to start with, but over the years I've sort of come to understand it a little bit more. I, d I wonder if that, obviously we're not, we're not the White House, but we are still a pretty big player in security and defense. Do you, have you ever ca had that occasion where, where you perhaps would rather decisions were not made. Just just this week, actually, yeah, that's a very. It's a very. I thought, I've thought about this week. Is that some sometimes, and you have different. Diff you have different sort of mindsets of the key figures that you serve or trying to deliver an agenda. So some of them, some of them see an interest in letting things rumble. Others are more sort of executive and want to get things done, cleaned cleaned off their, their plate. But I've just reflected this week. I can't tell you what this one's about, but but sometimes it's bet it's best not to kind of rush to try and bring things to an abrupt end. It's let it's best to let history sort of manage itself out. On the flip side I've seen examples of people being impatient with the not time to make a decision thing and and, and made bold, brave, sometimes foolhardy decisions by trying to rush the ramp ramparts and things as well. Just a just a boring academic reflection on that. So when I when I was musing and spent a month saying I wouldn't do this job when I was asked. Um, um, one of the people I, I just chatted to about it was um, a, uh, an academic called Richard Aldous, who just written a biography of Arthur Schlesinger, who is a historian who went in, into the JFK uh, White House and had just done a review of the book. Um, funny, it was called Pe The Perils of a Court Historian, which is about the dilemmas of Schlesinger going in and, and working with the, kind of, with the JFK administration. Um, and it was, it, was, so it, was, it was kind of Schlesinger's biographer who said to me, well, you kind of have to do it, don't you? Because you, you, know, you sort of reflected and, 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 and thought about it. But Schlesinger sort of wrestled with some of this as well, because you, you, you know, the, the, sort of the, the, the pace of historical change at various moments in time. Um, and he, he would write occasionally memos about things that he thought were going to go wrong. So he started by writing these memos and sort of squirreling them his way for his own historical record, and he shifted gear and started going in harder with, with these memos. And uh, it was an interesting case to live someone who's quite, you know, quite a demure, cautious personality who, who sort of played that game. And you do go through that dilemma. I mean, the intellectual thing to say is you're, you're living through kind of a dilemma constantly about historical change and the pace of historical change and the things that change. You know, are, are, you, are you stuck? Sometimes you feel like you're stuck in historical circumstances and you can't really get out. At other periods of time, you feel like actually you do have agency in the actions you take and the words you use and the decisions you make on resources or timing or, or uh, the, how brave you are or how cautious you are actually can change the circumstances in which you operate. Um, so sometimes you're helpless, stuck. Other times you, you, know, you, you can see agency, you can see the value of advice, you can see the value of decision making, speeches, phone calls. Um, other times it just feels like you're sort of in a loop. I mean, mindful that you're obviously still working uh, at the centre. I, I also wanted to ask you about how far you think there might be things that could practically be done to inform the, not just the quality of the, po of the policy advice, but, but the way in which advice is given to extremely busy decision makers, you know, sometimes who don't want to make decisions. Um, some people uh, here in our school have, have long argued that um, the Prime Minister needs something more akin to um, a, a Security Council staff of people coming in on, on secondment, not into um, number 10, but, it, but in, into a, you know, a, an expanded cabinet office, um, or more rotations coming in, or more alternative voices. I mean, you've now been working in it. Are, are any of those sorts of recommendations remotely uh, realistic, given what you've seen? Uh, yes, yeah, some of them are. So some, some of them, some ideas are less good than than others. Um, so, on the kind of um, 
having external advice and expertise coming in, yes, to a certain extent, but I think there's also the reality of that probably more important is having practitioners who have spent 20 years at the coal face of doing X, Y, Z issue, having the time to go out and think and it not, not, um, not, not sort of slowing their career, but actually enabling and, and, and improving their, their, their career pros prospects going back in. So it's quite hard when you're there and presence matters a lot and, and being close to, you know, if a minister pats you in the head or likes you, then it can, you know, so, so there's a disincentive to go away and think and study rather than coming back in. That's one aspect of it. So, but I think that can be quite, there can be permeation, it can be better. And, and there, is, there is increasing, I've seen it over the like, um, few years in government, there's, there's lots of appetite and interest in external voices, just not always the time to do it. Um, um, and sometimes the problems with universities and government is they're both two big bureaucracies trying to meet each other. So when they try and, try and do these things, it, it's sort of like two giant pandas. Um, but you, you, so you, you, need, you need a bit more, um, in, in and out, and it's got to be done in a fluid way, in a bespoke way. What, what I'm less convinced by, that you hear sometimes, is, is that you need sort of a, a, a sort of appointed figures like a chief government historian on X or Y, because then ultimately you just get sort of, I think, quite a static, um, um, you know, grandee producing um, um, kind of way, way, of, way of doing something, and that, that person becomes sort of part of the furniture. Whereas if you have sort of in and out and people with hinterlands and lands to go back to, if you can manage that process, and I don't think it means massive structural change, it just means a few appointments here and there, a bit of openness in the system where it, where it, where it can happen. I think that, that's probably the best way of doing it. But I, 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 see, that, I see that trend. So Gavin, or embarrassed Gavin, but Gar Gavin's are doing RCDS at the moment, for example. So, so you know, g going back and forth, and uh, I, I, I think that, that, that is happening. And I think, by and large, people, people are recept I think they're receptive to it, if I've not burned everyone and made life, made life miserable. I think they are receptive to it and open to it. And I think it is valued in a certain, certain world. And, you know, some, some different, you know, I mean, my, you know, um, I don't want to comment on my different bosses, but, you know, um, some ministers are obviously more interested in that type of skill set than others, but, but I think, I think it, it absolutely can work and it, 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 as long as you're sort of relatively preserved from getting your hands too far in the sort of political mangle. Yeah, don't, don't, don't knock uh, quasi-official historians. I've, I've just written a quasi-official account. Of a, that's, that's, that's good. That's so different than that's someone one, sitting on a perch or a yeah, throne. that's right. Yeah. Yeah. I certainly wasn't sitting on a perch. Uh, um, uh, that's very true. I mean, I was, I was interested in what you said about uh, uh, scientific advisors having had a, a longer-term role in, in much policy in, in, from various ministries. And I do recall Solly Zuckerman once writing that basically uh, he, he is responsible for us having the nuclear deterrence because he was in the room at the right moment and he added a few words to a, a outline agreement. Um, uh, and, that, and that was you know, obviously in the 1960s um, um, there. Now, I did have some other questions that people sort of suggested I ask you. I was asked if you would grade your prime ministers uh, by the most fun and the most difficult to work for, with. Um, I thought we'd leave that for your next book, uh, perhaps. Um, no way, I'm answering yeah, that one. There were, there, were some, there were some other ones about, uh, yes, um, I'll probably not ask you most of those questions. I think to, to sort of bring it to, to, to some conclusion, um, ultimately, um, what are you most proud about over the last four years? No, oh, I don't know. Um, uh, I'm not. I'm not. I don't think I've sort of sat and felt. You don't sort of feel pride or satisfaction, and you don't. Sort of, it was a bit maybe personal to me, but um, because it's, it's very fast moving. So as soon as you didn't screw something up, or did screw something up, the the advantage is it just moved. The next thing moves on. So like the the trend goes very quickly. Um, um, I, the most the most enriching thing is is using different parts of your brain at pace and learning different types of skills at that pace and be, being able to do that and you know there's a, there's a, I guess there's a there's a day a day there are days in the office when you're literally dealt with fifteen things um, in a different way and had a little say in each of them and that that's quite like you know your synapses are going like that so that that's that's probably the thing that's sort of it provides a certain level of satisfaction or it drains enough of your mental focus to distract you from other things. But I don't think if you, if you sort of sit and, and sort of toad-like smile and no, I, I don't, I, that, that's, I've never, I've never felt like that. It's been too, too panicked and fearful about screwing up, I think. Not a very fair question. Sorry about that, John. Um, and finally then, if you had one lesson 
that you'd want to pass on to our brilliant students who are interested in going into policy work, but that they should keep in mind? What would it be? I mean, I don't want to sound sort of, it, it, it sounds like I've, you've sort of, um, it's all set up, but it's not. I mean, I, I, I said before, when I'm looking at the, the screen and looking at the, the modules and the types of things that people are doing, this is exactly what people should be looking at to, to do that. I guess the other way around is that when I come back to academia, which I absolutely um, will, that, that, that what I'd quite like to do is actually put into the teaching some of the skill sets that aren't naturally um, things you do in academia, because we're focused on essays or a longer form or, or exams. There are different forms in terms of memorandums and, and uh, um, speeches or statements or Q&As for a uh, AUKUS press conference or whatever it is that I, I think are actually quite useful in terms of, they're quite inte useful intellectual exercises. So I think, I think, I think that, that, that that's, you know, learning those things actually are, 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 are a good way of doing it. Uh, and I guess the hurdle's not sort of so high, right? If you're interested and engaged in the broad subject matter, it's not, you know, there's, there's certain areas where the, where the depth of experience is unreachable from academia and student because it's field experience, it's, it's, uh, it's decades of traveling in certain very difficult places. Um, um, but the sort of the, the, the bar to go from, you know, good, solid undergrad, graduate, um, degrees into, into you know into producing good policy work. I don't think there's a there's a massive leap there, um, and I th so I think that's 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 but you know it's not none, none of this is sort of forbid forbidding or very difficult. Um, um, that'd be that'd be my message. Well, I, I think uh, as academics who have have gone out and come back, and also my colleagues in the school who've who've worked with practitioners and and policymakers and, and members of the military, uh, a bit of humility is, 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 is pretty much in order sometimes, but certainly the transferable skills that that sort of experience allows us to share with our students, I think is, is exactly where our students want to be. They want the rigorous academic background and, and guidance in developing their, their academic interests, but they also want to develop those transferable skills that will be useful um, when they go out into the wider world. John, I, I know, you know, A, you're very busy, but B, it's a difficult time, to, whilst you're still there, to talk about and reflect on it, but we're very grateful for you to uh, uh, almost return uh, uh, in, in March, and we look forward to having you back uh, in the fold uh, in, in the autumn um, uh, and, and sharing your experiences, um, not just with our students, but with your colleagues. Thanks very much indeed for coming. Thank you, John. I'll hand over to Chris. I was just going to say, um, yeah, huge thanks to John and John uh, for that uh, discussion. Hopefully, it was uh, hope it was really interesting, fascinating uh, for myself. We will continue the events now um, next door. So, as mentioned, we have the different research centres and groups uh, in the school that are setting up. So, please, you know. Do go across and learn more about their work. Uh, we'll also um, have some food and drink there, an opportunity for networking. And just finally, I've been asked by Lauren uh, on our events team to flag, because we will have photographs being taken next door. If you don't want to be in a photograph, uh, then please see Anna uh, at the back, who's waving uh, right now, and she will give you one of these green badges, and then the photographers will not capture you uh, in that. Great. Okay, so thanks very much.